Hello, everybody. This is Brother Luke, Sin City Preacher. Welcome to this Wednesday night Bible study for the Church of the Eternally Secure. Uh, if it's your first time with us on the Wednesday night Bible study, uh, welcome. Uh, I, I hope tonight is a, a blessing to you. Maybe uh, you'll like it enough that you want to join us every Wednesday. Uh, we also have a, a, a Sunday uh, church program that uh, starts at uh, 5 p.m. Eastern time every Sunday. Uh, so I hope you'll check us out on ch Sunday too, especially if you're one of these uh, unfortunate people that uh, you you believe Jesus is your great God and Savior, and uh, and yet you don't have any local congregation that you're satisfied with. I meet a lot of people like that. So we're trying to fill that need through the internet. And we have a lot of people that are telling us that uh, they're, they're thankful that we have this as a, a way to congregate, to, to fellowship. So to those people in the uh, chat room right now, they're, they're regular uh, participants, uh, welcome back. Hello to everybody. You see we got E. Mike W. and Sarah Jane, Celine, uh, Renee's hey with us. Hi, Renee. Hendrix. Uh, hey, Brian yeah. Jason. Yeah. Um, yeah, so Renee... Uh, I was just saying hi to everybody, and uh, so let's uh, let's go ahead. And now that you're here, uh, have you and, and Brother Cripps introduce yourself first. Uh, uh, if if you don't know uh, Sister Renee, uh, she'll tell you what she's doing here on YouTube. Go ahead, Sister. Hey, it's Renee Roland, channel of the same name. We contend for the gospel, the faith once delivered unto the saints. We try to untwist commonly twisted scriptures used to give people fear or to trust in themselves to get or keep salvation. Uh, and uh, that's the basis of, of our channel. Um, we also do prayer requests for people, but it's, it's mostly to edify the saints with the good news of the gospel of the grace of God. Oh, I was going to, I was going to make a little. No. Okay. Thank you. All right, so if there's anybody watching now or later on the upload, uh, uh, please subscribe to Renee Rowland. Uh, and and I'm sure you'll be, you'll be blessed by her teaching. And as she said, I certainly will uh, verify her claim that uh, she focuses on uh, teaching the real gospel and, and helping you understand the, the problem verses that confuse people. Uh, because we know that the gospel is the good news that you, you cannot work your way to, to heaven, but heaven is offered to all of us as a free gift from Jesus. And so uh, there are many people that saying that faith in Jesus for your salvation is not enough, that you've got to make contribute your part by doing uh, religious works. And uh, Renee does an excellent job refuting that, that false doctrine. Um, now, I we'll also have Brother Cripps with us. And Brother Cripps, tell them what you do here on YouTube. Sure. Thanks, Brother Luke. Uh, my name is Jason Cripps. I'm part of a channel called True Story Live or TSL, and we uh, try to stand in the gap between belief and unbelief, and we invite people to uh, come to kind of a roundtable discussion. We have a panel that answers questions uh, from uh, an atheist. Uh, so as believers, he kind of comes up with uh, topics that he would like answers to, or we'd like to hear our perspective on, on a certain topic. And usually there's questions involved and uh, we try to answer the questions. And in that we invite people to come and listen. And uh, we try to include everyone and show that even though we can uh, uh, disagree, that we can disagree in love and we can still uh, come to the table and, and uh, discuss things um, and uh, we try to be an example, uh, not just to believers, but or not just to unbelievers, but believers as well, uh, because I've seen a trend of a lot of arguing between bickering and stuff between uh, uh, people, so-called believers, and it's not the way that it's supposed to be. So we try to, to give an example, uh, uh, again, of how we can um, still get along and not all agree on the same topics. I mean, the essentials are important. Uh, but some of the other uh, things outside of that, um, we can talk about it. And uh, that's what TSL tries to do. It's true stories uh, from people's lives uh, that we hope edify and illuminate um, uh, stories. Uh, so I'm happy to be here. 
And I wanted to say to uh, Renee, tell tell Jim I missed the cat last week, believe it or not. So <laughs> I don't know if he's being uh, forbidden to uh, show the cat every once in a while. No, he wants to. He, okay. he wants to say, call everybody Grumpy Gills and bring the cat to him. And I say, well, let's do the intros before you yeah. do that. Okay, just tell them I missed the cat last <laughs> okay. week. That's, okay. Thanks, guys. All right. Thank you, Brother Cripps. Uh, and if you're not familiar with my channel, um, I identify myself as Brother Luke. Uh, if you're a, um, a believer, then you're my brother or sister. But my YouTube channel is, is named Sin City Preacher because I live in Sin City. That's Las Vegas, Nevada. So I live in Sin City and I'm a preacher. So that's why I got that name. Uh, my channel is comprehensive. I have playlists uh, on almost every theological subject. So I think my channel can serve as a great resource. Uh, I hope you'll you'll peruse your way through it and, and uh, look at all the playlists. And when you find one of, uh, a subject of interest, then uh, take the time to to uh, listen to it. Uh, my focus, and uh, matter of fact, all of our focus uh, primarily though is the gospel. We want to tell people um, about the person of Jesus and the means of salvation. There, we, we could feed the hungry and clothe the, the naked and, and visit the people in prison and all these good, wonderful things in ministry. But if we failed in this first task, uh, sharing the gospel, then, then uh, you know, everything else is, is, is in vain if we don't do that. <clears throat> now, uh, this Wednesday night program, we've been doing it now for quite a few months, and we've we've done topical studies uh, discussing uh, famous sermons uh, in the, of the past. Uh, I hope you go back and watch that. Those are archived on the Wednesday night Bible study playlist. But this particular Bible study is uh, we're now we're working our way through the Pauline epistles, and of course we started with Romans chapter one verse one. So I hope you will go back and watch this from the beginning if you haven't. Now, another place to, to begin that's relevant to tonight's uh, subject is uh, Romans chapter 9. I've said it many times. I, I, just, I just don't think I can repeat it too much. But Romans chapter 9 is one of the most important chapters in the whole Bible because it has been hijacked by a, a damnable heresy called Calvinism. and um, the, the Calvinists use Romans chapter 9 to um, misrepresent the God of the Bible and, and the relationship between God and man. So, and they, they, that's because they, they treat Romans chapter 9 as a personal salvation chapter. So we must not uh, think that this chapter is talking about personal individual salvation. I've said many times, as we've been going through it up to this point, that uh, the Apostle Paul, about half of everything he says in this is, is are not his own words. He's giving us the words for, of Moses for in Genesis, in Exodus. He's given us the world, words of the prophet Jeremiah. Uh, um, half of Romans chapter 9 are quotes from those. Uh, and so he's, he talks about... Uh, um, Jacob and Esau, he talks about, uh, you know, the, the Pharaoh, uh, and he talks about the potter and the clay, and everything on those subjects that he says are direct quotes from the Old Testament. So if we are going to really understand what is intended by Paul, we need to go back into the Old Testament and see what was happening in, in, the, in that scenario. That's the context. And that's what we've been doing up to this point. So, but now uh, we're going to we're on verse 25, but we're going to back up to verse 23 to lead into it. And here we go. Um, and that he might make known the riches of his glory on the vessels of mercy, which he had afore prepared unto glory. Even us whom he hath called, not of the Jews only, but also of the Gentiles. Now verse 25 as he saith also in O.C., I will call them my people, which were not my people, and her beloved, which was not beloved. And it shall come to pass 
that in the place where it was said unto them, ye are not my people, there shall they be called the children of God. So that gets us through verse 26. Um, now, this also, uh, let me see. This portion is not a quote. Uh, so let, let's just, let's just uh, uh, teach on this based upon what Paul is saying there. I'll start with Sister Renee. And uh, Jason, go first on this. Yeah, sure. Go ahead, Brother Jason. He can. Now, I, uh, I, you guys probably know more about this particular part of these verses than I do. Uh, but um, to me, he's talking uh, to the Gentile believers, if I understand it right. Um, they were not his people. Uh, he, he chose the Israelite people and... Um, there was rejection involved. I mean, that story's not over yet. But then, um, it was first to the salvation was first to the Jews and then to the Gentiles. And I think that that's what this to me that's what this verse is talking about. Um, you are not my people, but you became my uh, became my people, and it shall come to pass that in the place where it was said unto them, "You are not my people," there shall be uh, they be called the children of living God. That's all of us. Um, all of us outside of um, uh, the original choice of the Israel uh, Israeli people. That's that's my understanding. I'm, uh, 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 they, uh, I guess that's it for that. I think. Yep. Um, all I'll say is that uh, um, I've said this over and over again that almost all of the prior verses are quotes from the Old Testament, and these are not direct quotes. But it doesn't change the fact that we're still talking about Israel right now. That's that's the point that I will make. But Renee, what do you have to say about this? The reason I did that is I was double checking something before I said it. Mm -hmm. uh, OC, as I shall say, hold on. As I shall say, are, are we down at twenty five or yet? Because that's what I was checking. We we're at twenty three, right? 25 we uh okay, we are read, there okay yeah. i want to make sure yeah. as he 25 and 26 both we are okay read. as he shall also say in oc i will call them my people which were not my people and her beloved which was not beloved the story here that he's referring to is when he told the prophet hosea to take an unfaithful wife uh he told hosea to um to marry a prostitute and so the reference there uh, that he's talking about is in the Old Testament when God used the prophet marrying a prostitute to show how his heart was broken for the unfaithfulness of Israel. So um, he's referencing that. And in regards to Israel this time, it's not Hosea marrying uh, uh, them. It's God. God is, uh, he was married to unfaithful Israel, but he's not only married to her, he is married to a people that's not his people, uh, which are the Gentiles, like Jason pointed out. But I wanted to make sure that I was referencing the correct thing there. That's why I checked, uh, which if it was in Hosea or not, um, because I didn't want to be incorrect on it. But uh, that story is so profound. In, in how willing God is to love us, uh, uh, you know, when we're unfaithful. Uh, but he's using that picture of him marrying a prostitute uh, and the humiliation that Hosea had to go and buy her back um, uh, off of, a, off of a, a block where they were selling women. And uh, it, it's, it shows a remnant of Israel that he's going to say, but how he is also going to the unfaithful, the completely unfaithful, the, the Gentiles that were never his, his inheritance. He is now making them his people uh, by faith. I, I think that's what he's saying. Okay. Yeah. Uh I mentioned earlier that uh, um, 
um, uh, I, Isaac being uh, loved and Esau being hated as a problem. And that's why we had to go back to get the context to understand it. We did that the last two studies, or two studies ago. And then we talked about the another problem, and that was Pharaoh and hardening his heart and how the Calvinists will, will teach that incorrectly, that uh, we don't have a free will. God is controlling everything man does. So uh, we, we addressed that last Wednesday. Uh, and then the other problem in this chapter is the, um, um, uh, the potter and the clay. Uh, the Calvinists will teach that that shows that uh, God can save whoever he wants. That's how the Calvinists will say it. God, God is choosing whoever he wants. That's, that's all that's based upon God's sovereign choice. But the point I'm trying to make in this whole study here is that um, God is sovereign. God does have um, the ability to do whatever he wants to do. Uh, he's he's all powerful. Uh, but in his sovereignty, God elected to give mankind free will because without free will, man and God could not have a real love relationship. If we were controlled like robots, programmed like a robot, then uh, we, we, it'd be impossible with our own choice to have a relationship with God. So for that reason, God gave us a free will so we can be free to want to be with God or not want to be with God. And uh, that's the important thing to understand here, that these these problem areas of Romans 9 that I just mentioned, the, those three problems, you need, you need to understand that when Paul is quoting the Old Testament, every time we show that he was not talking about personal salvation, not once. He only was talking about God's sovereign right, God's sovereign ability to choose individuals to develop a, a genealogy of people to uh, eventually lead to the birth of a chosen one, the Messiah, Jesus Christ, and a nation from him, Israel. So that's really what it's about, God electing individuals and a nation for this purpose. It's not about God electing or choosing people to get saved or not get saved. That's the thing that we need to understand. Now we're, we're, we're going to be moving away from that concept, but at this point we're still haven't talked about personal salvation yet. I'm going to read a little bit further. Uh, verse, uh, I'm going to read 25 uh, and give more context here. As he saith also in Osi, I will call them my people, which were not my people, and her beloved, which was not beloved. And it shall come to pass that in the place where it was said unto them, ye are not my people, there shall be called the children of the living God. Esaias, that's another way of, saying Elijah the prophet also crieth concerning Israel though the number of the children of Israel be as the sand of the sea a remnant shall be saved for verse 28 for he will finish the work and cut it short in righteousness because a short work will the Lord make upon the earth um, and as is Isaiah said before except the Lord of Sabbath had left us a seed we had been as Sodom and been made like unto Gomorrah. Okay, uh, Brother Cripps, 25 yeah. to 29. I guess. Sure, sure. Uh, well, I did uh, 25 and 26. So 20, 27 and 28. Uh, so in 27, uh, the children of Israel will be as saying to see the remnant. That's the remnant of, of, uh, uh, of people that actually believed. Um, and then the fun part is 28, because I'm uh, in the way that revolution, uh, Revelations plays out. Um, we know that uh, God's story with Israel is not finished yet. And this is stating the fact that it will be finished and it will be a short work, meaning when, uh, when he does his work in Israel in the end times, it, it won't take very long. And uh, we know from scripture that there, there will be many uh, with the witnesses and with the angels uh, ministering and everything that goes on during that time, they will discover that they killed Christ and that he was their Messiah. And in that many of them will be saved and it won't take very long. That's my understanding. Please correct me if I'm wrong. Um, 
it's interesting that I have not studied these particular verses all that extensively. Uh, that's that's the way that I see them. So um, I'll I'll uh, send it over to you guys for more um, exposition. Okay, Renee. Before I ask you to give us your thoughts on it, I want to just shed the, this light here that um, uh, this portion in verse twenty nine. It says it is it is as Isaiah for I'm reading now from the Amplified, so it's not Isaiah. It's he, they pronounce it as Isaiah. That's how they wrote it, because it's really talking about the prophet Isaiah. Uh, I guess Isaiah is just another way of pronouncing his name. But it says in the Amplified, verse 29, it is as Isaiah foretold, and then there's quotes until we get to the end of the verse. So. From this point forward here, this is quoting quoting, uh, Isaiah. If the Lord of hosts had not left us seed, that is future generation from which a believing remnant of Israelites came, we would have become like Sodom and and would have resembled Gomorrah, totally rejected and destroyed. Renee? Yeah. uh, Here's here's my chance to... Oh, man, do I hate when people take Matthew 24 and 25 and try to say this is to the church. This is full on revelation about the last days, the time of Jacob's trouble. Then God's working on the nation of Israel that is foretold in the Old Testament. But when you don't read the Old Testament, you think everything is to us. So. I want to line something up here. So when when it says, for he will, okay, Isaiah cries concerning Israel, and it's a direct quote, though the number of the children of Israel be as the sand of the sea, a remnant shall be saved. So not all, everybody keeps saying, so just because they're Jews, they're saved. No, a remnant shall be saved. For he will finish the work and cut it short in righteousness. And I'm going to give you a verse that popped into my head about that. Because a short work will the Lord make upon the earth. And as Isaiah said before, except the Lord of the Sabbath had left us us a seed, we've been to Sodom and made like Gomorrah, wouldn't be none of them left. He's saying none of the whole, just like all of Sodom and Gomorrah were destroyed except for Lot, righteous Lot and his family. So Matthew 24 says this, and except those days should be shortened, there should no flesh be saved. But for the elect's sake, those days shall be shortened so god is saving them shortening of the time there because if it continued all of them would be lost that's why it says and he he who who shall endure to the end the same shall be saved he's talking about the jewish people during this time the days are going to be shortened they're not only physically saved but they're you know, eternally saved because they see him coming. They call for him and he returns. So if this is another example of proving that Matthew 24 is about the nation of Israel in regards to Old Testament prophecy and is not to the church about the rapture or any of that that people are teaching. So uh, I was happy to see that. Boom. Yay. Yeah. Amen. The, uh, The word remnant is an interesting word, a very important word that uh, people think of remnant applying only to Israel and then also to our church uh, today uh, because of all the people in the world who identify themselves as some kind of a Christian today, I doubt more than uh, 10% of them believe in the Christianity that we find in the Bible. Christianity meaning that salvation is not earned through our our religious efforts, it's received as a free gift because of our faith in the person and finished work of Jesus Christ. Uh, Almost all Christendom, people who identify themselves as Christians, do not understand and believe that basic thing. That is the heart of Christianity, that is the gospel. Um, so those of us, Renee, Brother Cripps, myself, many of us watching right now, we are also a remnant, a sliver of people throughout history who have been uh, believing in that God would provide a solution to man's problem, 
man had a problem and that we were separated from God because of sin. And we could not have a relationship with God. And also that we were uh, had a death sentence on us. Um, that problem, man has never been able to solve it through appealing to God. Oh, I'm, I'm, don't you think I'm good enough now? Um, that that system. That's by the way. Look at this shirt. Look at this. We, I was just talking to this with Brother Leo Larson earlier today. This concept: Christianity is not a religion. Uh, so I thought I pulled this shirt out from the closet. But uh, the saying "Christianity is not a religion" is, I believe, is, is accurate. I define religion as any uh, system of um, um, man. A, attempting to earn approval or acceptance from God, uh, a, a system of do's and don'ts to present to God that you're you're good enough and acceptable. That's religion. All the religions of the world are based upon this idea of personal merit. But uh, Christianity, as I said, is not based upon personal merit. Salvation, Christianity is based upon Christ is my Savior. He's the one that, I, that, that, that matters. Not, it's not about me. It's about him, who he is and what he's done for me. Um, so the, we are a remnant. A tiny little fraction of the world has always believed right. And from Adam and Eve's fall and, and, and uh, throughout all the history of mankind, there's always been a sliver of humanity that understood that God would provide a solution to man's problem, uh, sin and death. And they and and gradually there's been a dispensation the act of dispensing revelation through the scriptures god giving us more and more uh, uh information making it more and more clear uh until we finally have the full revealed revelation that this promised savior has come and it's jesus of nazareth uh, so this idea of being a remnant yes we are a remnant the, the, there was always a remnant in the nation of Israel, a, a certain pe percentage of people in the nation of Israel that was uh, a tiny group, fraction of people that had it right. And then even before Israel was formed, there was a tiny group of people that were always relying on God to solve their problem. Um, okay, any more on that before I read further? Yeah, I'm sorry to bring this up, but there's uh, there's something up with your mic, uh, Brother Luke. I don't know if you've got something resting again. It sounds like someone blowing on it uh, in the background. I just wanted to let you know. Well, it's my fan. Like, I'll turn the fan off, but uh, you remember I told you I get real hot sometimes? Oh, I understand. I'm just letting you know. It's, uh, it's, yeah. up. <laughs> it's, not, it's not the mic. It's just that when I turn the fan on, you get that sound. But could, did you understand the words I said? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, right. yeah. I, I'm okay. with you on that because I right. think there's a lot less people that are actually in the body of Christ than claim it. Okay, but the idea of a remnant not applying only to uh, the you know the Bible, the the Church of the Bible, but but uh, you know the the Church of today and also the yes. even, even before before Israel. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. All right. Let me go a little further then here. Uh, now we're going to go to Romans uh, 30 through 33. What shall we say then? Oh, my gosh. Apostle Paul's asking a question. Brother Cripps, can you believe that? This is formed in the, made in the form of a question. <laughs> I can. We've, as you've pointed out several times, uh, Paul is uh, very used that's to your, using That's your favorite. I know you're shocked. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it's 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 a style of writing and it's a technique of communicating that is very, very interesting. Paul does it more so than anybody else. And, and many times he's doing it because there is a crit criticism and he is representing it like, well, OK, well, what if this was the case? Well, and then he gives you the answer. He's one step ahead. He already knows. Yeah, what exactly. He's one step ahead. He knows the criticism. He's and he's saying, well, well, what if this? Okay, I'll give you the answer to that because I know what you're thinking. <laughs> okay, uh, so verse 30, 31 through 33. Uh, what shall we say then? That the Gentiles, which follow not after righteousness, have attained to righteousness, even the righteousness which is of faith. 
But Israel, which followed after the law of righteousness, have not attained to the law of righteousness. Wherefore? Because they sought it not by faith, but as it were, by the works of the law. For they stumbled at that stumbling stone. As it is written, behold, I lay in Zion a stumbling stone and rock of offense, and whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. Okay, Renee. Yeah, I, I love that. There's a lot of verses about him being the stone, the chief cornerstone, the stone the builders rejected. Um, let me uh, go over here. Let me read this part. What should we say then, Gentiles, which followed not after righteousness, attained righteousness, even the righteousness of faith, but Israel, which followed after. So they were given the laws to be righteous by works. Nevertheless, they did not obtain righteousness. But the Gentiles never had the laws. They never had the laws. But Paul even points out in other places, hey, they didn't even have the law and they did what was right. So uh, just, you know, by knowing. So there's a verse over here in Galatians that tells us why that works with this. Is the law then against the promises of God? God forbid. There's the question again, Luke. For if there had been a law given which could have given life, verily or truly righteousness should have been by the law. But the scripture concluded all in the sin that the promise might be by faith of Jesus Christ might be given to them that believe. So that works perfectly with these scriptures here that Israel got the law. And that's God's perfect standard, but they couldn't keep it either because the, the scriptures have concluded everybody under sin. And now the reason they can't get it, wherefore? Why? There's the other question, another one, Luke. Because they sought it not by faith, but as it were by the works of the law. They still haven't gotten to the end of themselves to where they think they're still righteous. So they stumble at that stumbling stone. And Jesus is that rock of offense. And he's the one that if he falls on you, you'll be crushed to powder. So, uh, and whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. They can't do it because they're still trying to earn it by works. And so do the Catholics and so do Jehovah's Witnesses and so do the Mormons. And so do most of evangelical Christianity that claims to be Protestant. So that that's, it's showing me the remnant. The point that Luke made earlier is even truer than ever the remnant is really smaller than we could ac actually ever imagine. And that makes me very, very sad. Yeah. Uh, well, the uh, first 20 of uh, four verses, uh, it took us uh, two studies to get through them. And uh, the, the remainder of the chapter is really easy in comparison. But, but uh, I want to take some time to kind of go back and put all the pieces together before we move on to the next chapter here. So let me, let me do that here. Uh, go back here to a few key points here. If we go to verse uh, number, um, uh, verse numbers. Well, first Paul talks about how I have great heaviness and continual sorrow in my heart. Uh, he says that he would, he would sacrifice his own salvation if, if if his brethren, the Jewish people, would believe. I mean, that's how much he cares about his people. Uh, and, and that's how it begins. And, and, and then he's, he's saying, the point I made in the first two weeks ago, this is very, very important to get this, is that when Paul says here that, um, um, verse 6, not as though the word of God had taken none effect, well, the point I made back then, I went into more detail. I'll, I'll make it more succinct this time. But uh, I believe Paul is, is making the point that, look, he, he was talking about how it was the Jewish people, the nation of Israel, that we got Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Judah, Jesse, David, this lineage. It's the, that nation of Israel, the Jewish people, that gave us the, the, the prophets and even the scriptures. It's the Jewish nation and Jewish people that, that the Messiah came from that genealogy as predicted by God and God, how God designed it. He elected uh, Isaac 
Jacob instead of Esau. He elect, he elected uh, um, Isaac instead of Ishmael, and so on, so on. Uh, we went through that. God chose one person over another person to get this genealogy just right, the way He wanted it, and to bring the Messiah in. And so Paul's saying, this is this is like making Israel so special, and yet almost none of Israel Israelites believe, are believers. In, in, how many people lived in, in the nation of Israel at the time Paul wrote this, I wonder? I don't know. Maybe there were 1 million, 5 million, 10 million? I don't know. But this many, a little remnant of those Jewish people who had all this Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Judah, Jesse, David, the scriptures, the Messiah came from them, and only this tiny little fraction of this whole nation actually believed the Messiah came. It's, it was Jesus. And Paul is saying, it, it, you could think that the, God is, is, was not very effective. Let, let me say it here. Uh, verse 6, not as though the word of God had taken none effect. He's saying, you shouldn't think just because hardly any Jewish people are believers. It's all Gentiles now. <laughs> That's the point it's reaching here. It's convert, moving from a Jewish thing to a Gentile thing, and the Jews or Jewish people are avoiding it as a whole. And he's saying, well, it's not like God's plan was not effective, like he made a mistake using Israel. Uh, and then he goes through talking about how God accomplished this, how God elected and uses his sovereign ability to choose each of these individuals. You know, uh, uh, as I said, he, he selected uh, uh, Isaac instead of the firstborn, Ishmael. Uh, he selected Jacob, who was not the firstborn. That was Esau. And, and then he also uh, says that he, uh, he used Pharaoh to accomplish his, his, his purpose. And he also has the right he pointed out that he had the right, just like a potter building clay and destroying clay and using how he has the right to do what he wants with the clay. God had had the right to do what he did with Israel throughout that historic period. All the things in Exodus, Genesis, Exodus, and Jeremiah that Paul was quoting and taking us to, go look at this in Jeremiah, go look at this in Exodus and Genesis, all those places Paul was quoting and taking us to were accounts of how God was um, using uh, Israel, developing Israel. And so that's what the chapter is about. And now we get to the end of it and we can see that, okay, uh, the problem was in Israel, their mistake was, they sought it, but not by faith, but by works. That's how, that's how the chapter is ending. Okay, uh, that's kind of my little summary of the whole thing. Let me ask you before we move on to the next chapter and verse, uh, uh, Brother Cripps, kind of give me a summary of your thoughts on, on chapter 9. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you did a great job doing. I didn't. I didn't comment on these verses, and I did want to say uh, something about. Oh, I'm them. sorry. I'm sorry. I, I don't. I apologize. How? I, how could I forget not to let you comment? That's okay. No problem. Um, yeah, because these ones are. <laughs> I understand these ones pretty clearly. Uh, so, verse thirty. It's just making the the point that I wish a dispensationalists would understand these four these four verses. Um, because they seem to have an impression that people, when they were under the law, were able uh, to have righteousness through the, the sacrifices. And I, I don't understand that. I really, really don't get how they, they feel that way. Um, it makes it pretty clear that the, the Gentiles uh, uh, didn't, not only did they not know, know the law, they, they were never given the opportunity to do that. And I'm sure that other countries looking at uh, the Israeli religion, I'm, it made no sense to them, I'm sure. Um, but nevertheless, uh, uh, for Israel, it definitely was a stumbling block because they, and, and um, not just back then, but even, even still today, and also to every other religion that puts up works instead of resting in, what Christ did on the cross and getting uh, righteousness through faith. Um, so this is refreshing to me, to anyone that understands it. Um, Israel followed after the law of righteousness, hath not attained to the law of righteousness. So verse 31 
is the non-dispensationalist uh, verse to me in, in making the point that, uh, yeah, they follow the law, but they didn't achieve righteousness. Christ had to come in order for righteousness to be achieved in the first place. Um, that had to happen. And now that it has happened, we can all come to him um, in faith and attain righteousness based on what he did. And that is um, something that we all cling to, the remnant clings to. Um, and the the part that uh, Renee mentioned about the corner, the chief cornerstone that the builders rejected, yeah, absolutely. And that's making the point again that he came to his own people and his people received him not. And uh, they will in the end, uh, as we talked about, will make uh, a quick work or um, short work. Uh, in the end, uh, they will, many of them will turn back to him, but still of all the people through all, throughout all the time, it will still be a remnant, comparatively speaking, to the amount of people that could have accepted him and could have followed righteousness, the path of righteousness. Um, yeah, that's it. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Uh, okay, Renee, uh, can you give kind of summarize? I know you weren't with us all three weeks uh, of the study of chapter nine, but I, I think the little brief summary I gave you gave you a pretty good yeah. thumbnail sketch. What are your thoughts on it? Yeah, uh, the main thing I like to see that came out of this is um, disputing the Calvinistic uh, election doctrine uh, because again god uh, chose uh esau and jacob as nations uh and, and he loved jacob israel uh, i mean he favored that nation to bring his son through so and i like that you addressed the hardening of the heart uh he was already hardened and god just went in, i mean he, it was for the purpose of his people i mean he foretold abraham you know hey your people are going to be in captivity for 400 years and then I'm going to judge that nation. He told him that the day he made a covenant with him when he put him to sleep and he and the sun, I believe it was he and the sun, the furnace and the torch walking through the animal park, uh, you know, 400 years earlier. So uh, God can and will make his purpose known. But again, those aren't in relative to uh, eternal salvation. And I'm so glad uh, that you guys uh, cleared that section up. And we're also seeing here that uh, nobody after, according to the flesh, is saved because of their genealogy. Uh, everybody's saved uh, by faith. And we also see that, that it's a remnant, not just of the Jews, but of the Gentiles. He offers it freely by his grace to all. But unfortunately, pride, fear, or something, the fearful and unbelieving are the ones mentioned in Revelation. So pride and fear uh, keep people from trusting that what Christ did is enough. Um, and, and it's unfortunate, but I, I really think it was a, the biggest thing here was to get rid of that. Uh, like you said, destroying God's character, like the Calvin, you know, Calvin was only 26 when he wrote that and he was straight out of the Catholic church. That path leads right back to Rome. And it's, it's another God. Uh, it's not just gives him a bad name. I think. So I'm glad you cleared that up. Yeah, thank you. Well, since you mentioned uh, Calvin and the Catholic Church, I, I, I did tell everybody this, uh, I think probably a couple of weeks ago, uh, that, that Calvinism, it's not really right to call it Calvinism. Uh, really, it was really developed through Augustine. Calvinism, Calvin only taught what he learned from Augustine. And, uh, oh, I've, uh, you know, people tend to um, think that there are two types of Christians, a Calvinist or Arminian. They, if, if you say you're not a Calvinist, then they, they automatically think, well, you must be, by default, Arminian. And uh, we, I can speak for uh, the rest of us, too, because I know, I know there are thoughts on this. Uh, we are neither Calvinist nor Arminian. Each one of them is a damnable philosophy, full of false doctrine. Um, we are biblical Christians, people who believe the Christianity as we find it in the Bible. And I already summarized what that means, that it's by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, eternal security, and the deity of Christ. Those are the core doctrines. Um, okay, we'll move on now to uh, uh, chapter 10. 
Well, by can the way, I, can I explain one thing to Chris about Jacob and, and them? Because he's saying the Jacob I love, Esau I hate, it proves God doesn't love everybody. Jacob became Israel and and Esau became Edom. He's not talking about them personally so much. And the words love and hate here, the Hebrew words do not mean that I, he hates him. It means he favored one above another, meaning he hated he 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 favored the nation of Israel for his son to be born through. He didn't mean he hated Esau like he was going to send him to hell. That that's not what it means or that he he didn't bless him in some way. He's just saying he's the less favored nation. He chose the nation, Jacob, who became Israel, and Esau, who became Edom later. Uh, this You have to read it. You, he's not saying I hate and I don't love everybody. And the world and God so loved the world in 316, the word there used in Greek is cosmos. It does mean world. It doesn't mean just special people, just Israel, the elect. The world cosmos, that means the entire world. You can't make words mean what you want them to mean. Yeah. Uh, I can see your, uh, I think you're responding to Chris Wiggins here. I don't know Chris, but uh, uh, Chris, uh, uh, you need to go back and watch last Wednesday and the Wednesday before, particularly two weeks ago. That's when we talked about uh, Jacob and Esau because we analyzed that uh, from the left and the right inside outside upside down and we went right to the exact quotes paul made where it was in the old testament in genesis and exodus and, and so you if you don't go back and watch that then shame on you because you're going to hold on to your false belief about this and uh, if you do have the integrity to look at uh, that and find out what paul's actually talking about what was the intention of the writer at the time it was written? Uh, that If you realize that uh, half of the verses in chapter 9 are direct quotes, then you need to go back to find out what he's quoting and what, what he's leading, he's referring to. If you don't do that, then uh, you know, you're, you're not studying with integrity. Uh, well, I'm going to move on now. But Renee, you did an excellent job of summarizing it, though. Uh, okay, let's go to chapter 10 now. Uh, verse one. Oh, I let me post this here for uh, Brother Cripps. Let me see. I'll post the first. For I'm gonna try to put the first seven verses in there. We'll see. I don't know if we'll get that far, but Brother Cripps, I'll put it right here into the private chat space for us. Thank you, sir. You know I appreciate that. I got it. Thank you. Okay. Good. Okay. Okay. Uh, Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. For I bear them record that they have a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. Okay, I, I, we, I, I don't want to even go beyond that because I quoted that last uh, yesterday to Brother Matthias in a private conversation. I was talking about so many people that I'm encountering on YouTube that uh, uh, I apply this, this principle to. Not this, these verses, that's not, the, that's not the context of these verses. See, here's the mistake that I see a lot of us making, and even people that I'm close to and I love them, but they're taking a verse and using it for their own purposes to support a viewpoint. And um, we can do that as long as we, we say what I'm saying now. In context, the intended meaning of this verse is something else. We're going to discuss the intended meaning. But I'm spiritualizing now and taking, giving you a spiritual principle. And that is that I encounter a lot of people on YouTube who uh, they haven't even read through the Bible one time. They, they got saved a few months ago or even a couple of years ago. And they, uh, and they, they are coming on and teaching and, and arguing against people who've studied for 10, 20, 30 years. Now, you may think, well, that's kind of arrogant. You think that you know more just because you've been saved longer. Yeah, I'm sorry, but that's a fact. If you haven't, Paul, do you know Paul waited 14 years to go on his missionary? People wonder, what, what, what was Paul doing for 14 years? Not that I'm in Paul's class, but I waited 18 years. 18 years of study before I decided 
publicly do any kind of ministry. So I, I'm asking everybody, James says, be quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to anger. Uh, but I'm seeing people that are just recently saved and haven't even read the Bible through one time yet, and they're coming on and, and, and trying to teach with authority against people who've studied their whole lives. And you need to stop teaching until you're ready. And so, um, but uh, let me ask Renee, go ahead. Uh, that's it. I'm, I'm taking a principle from the verse, but I know that's not really actual context here. What do you say, Renee? I can't answer it right now because I was I was fussing at somebody in the chat room. Okay, Brother Cripps. Yeah, no problem at all. So, um, uh, first of all, just what the ver well, let me let me comment on what you're saying. I I, I just want to double down on what you're saying that I completely agree. Um, it, it's so unfortunate that there are people out there that seem to just uh, pick verses and 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 not only just base it a uh, a single teaching on it, but so many things based on verses taken out of context. And I also agree with you that um, if you're if you're going to be a minister, then you need to take the time to make sure that you understand the verses in context and make sure that you know the material. Um, I agree also with Brother Luke and what you're saying that it's okay to to use a scripture to to make a uh, I forget what word you use to to make a point about scripture that may be out of context but not using it for uh, uh, specifically teaching but to make some certain point I think that's that's perfectly acceptable and the way you used it um, is 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 great so just what the verses are talking about themselves in context of everything. Um, uh, beginning, Paul's just simply pouring out his heart's desire as he did it throughout all chapter nine and, and talking about the grief that he felt towards Israel. And uh, so here he's saying that again, he's saying my heart, you know, is, is this is the way my heart is, my, my, the desire of my heart and his prayers are that Israel would be saved. Uh, and then verse two, bear record that they have a zeal of God. So um, all all the the law, following the laws and uh, the people that did try to do the the sacrifices and do what they were supposed to do as a good Israelite, um, that could be considered zeal. But they're not understanding. So the knowledge, in in my opinion, would be that uh, Christ crucified and resurrected at this point. Um, so if they understood that knowledge, their zeal uh, would would be of effect because they would understand through knowledge that it's Jesus on which everything should be based and not on the, the stumbling block of the law. Uh, thank you. All right, uh, Renee, uh, before, you yeah, comment, sorry. <laughs> before you comment on verse one and two, I'm, I'm gonna read it in the Amplified. Okay. So you get their thoughts on this. It says, brothers and sisters, my desire, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is for their salvation. For I testify about them that they have a certain enthusiasm for God, but not in accordance with correct and vital knowledge about him and his purposes. Right? Okay, okay now, okay. All right, yeah, uh, I, I'm with Jason, you, uh, Paul is brokenhearted over this. He, he loves his, uh, family. He loves his blood. You know, he, he loves his nation and he's grieved. Uh, I wonder, you know, I, I, I bet his empathy comes from his own ignorance. I, I believe maybe God chose him. One of the reasons is he was a student of Gamaliel and, and God could reveal to him how the old Testament scriptures had come to life in Christ. Because in his letters, he surely makes the Old Testament. He quotes so much Old Testament and brings it to life, showing what Jesus did. And I bet his heart, you know, feels bad and there's empathy there because he remembers in his own ignorance when he was persecuting the church, thinking he was doing God a favor, you know. And he knows in their blindness, it's going to take a miracle to get him out of that blindness. Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. For I bear them record, they have a zeal of God, 
but not according to knowledge. And I, I want to say that there's a lot of zealous people. Uh, the Jews are very religious. They have a zeal of God. They do. You get, I mean, look, look at how uh, faithful they are to their religion. But it's not according to knowledge. It's not by faith. They're still trying to earn it, as it were, by works of the law. And I would say that little section there, for I bear them record that they have a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. I'd say the same thing about the Catholics, about the Jehovah's Witnesses, about the Hindus. They got a wrong God, but they're sure crying out for him, aren't they? See him bowing down to these idols. They want so badly to be in touch with God. I, I'd say, you know, a, a, a lot of people have a zeal of God. They want to love God or they... You know, they, or they think they love Jesus, so they're working really hard, and they think it's offensive to not work hard for salvation. When in reality, it's it's uh, it's arrogant. They can't see that. Sometimes, sometimes the way I actually get through to people is to show them how arrogant and how it's spitting on the cross to not believe what he did was enough. But they have a zeal of God, but it's not according to knowledge because they they're really um excited about god they live for they think they're living for god they're uh zealous of their religion but but it's not according to knowledge god they're not doing it god's way do you remember when jesus told the woman in samaria you know they that worship him will worship him in spirit and truth he told him you you know you don't you worship you know not what well they had a zeal of god too on that mountain and at that time you did have to worship in jerusalem so they had a zeal of God too, but not according to knowledge at that time. And it's the same thing now. They, You can see they're very religious people, but it's not according to knowledge. And I think he's heartbroken over it. I'm heartbroken over it. Yeah. Amen. Uh, you really did an excellent job uh, teaching on that verse as Paul intended, the point Paul intended for us to get. And, and uh, when I first talked about the verse, I, I was applying it in a, in a different way, on a broader way. Uh, but now I'll talk just for a moment about specifically what Paul is saying and who he's saying it to. Is that yeah, yeah it's Paul. You, Renee, I, I think it's today I watched a video you made about talking about Gamaliel and, and Paul's training with Gamaliel. And before you spoke just now, I was just going to say, Renee, remember when you talked about Paul learning from Gamaliel and, and how does that apply to this? Well, Paul is identifying the Jewish people uh, as having this zeal, but not according to knowledge because they don't understand it's not by the law. And guess what? Paul had that zeal without knowledge. Best example in the world. He had so much zeal for Judaism and against Christ, this new thing, Christianity, that he was going around jailing and murdering Christians. He wanted to murder them all. That's how much zeal he had, but it took Jesus appearing to him in person to have Paul see the light. I don't know if Paul ever could have been persuaded. I don't know. I uh, Let's say that Let's say that one of the uh, apostles or something got a hold of Paul one day and and started witnessing to him or something. Well, look what happened to Stephen. <laughs> so I don't think Paul would have been persuaded uh, unless it took Jesus appearing to him to convince him uh, that he had his zeal was not according to knowledge. Um, all right, we'll move on. Unless uh, any more on that, either of you, before we go on. Okay, let's go to. Uh, Verse three and four. Uh, this, by the way, verse three here. This is one of the verses I have on my uh, in my description box of my videos. Every video in the description box, I have a list of verses uh, to present the gospel, and this is one of them because this verse, the point being made in verse three, is that important to understand. It says, "For they." being ignorant of God's righteousness and going about to establish their own righteousness, have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. For Christ, this is verse four, for Christ is the end of the law for righteousness 
to everyone that believeth. Uh, okay, Brother Cripps. Thank you, thank you, thank you. So, so this is beautiful, verse 3. Um, this is every other religion that isn't resting in Christ's finished work. Every single one of them. Um, amen, amen, amen. I'm sorry, I had to say amen. Oh, thank you. <laughs> yeah. Praise God, praise God. That uh, th That is extremely clear from this verse. Um, if anyone is uh, setting up anything that has to do with their own righteousness instead of relying on what Christ did, then they, they do not have righteousness, plain and simple. Um, they can think that they do all they want, but they're deceived. Um, uh, other, other verses in the scripture make it very clear that our righteousness is as filthy rags, and that is true. I know, uh, for me at least, I I uh, will only be standing before God, and he when he asks me the question, um, why should I let you? I mean, he's not going to, but for the sake of argument, why should I let you into uh, my rest? I will say for no other reason but what Christ did for me that I accepted that, um, and it's all what He did. So, verse four for for uh, you may, Paul makes the point here for Christ. Christ is the end of the law of righteousness for everyone that believeth, saying that Jesus is the only way that we attain righteousness. There is no other way, only through what Jesus did. That's it. Not through being a good person, not through tithing, not through doing good works. None of that means anything if you don't have what Christ did for us. Thank you. Brother Luke. Well said. Yes. Today somebody sent me a thing saying, my sister-in-law is a Seventh-day Adventist said, you got to keep the Sabbath. I said, oh, she only picked one of the laws that you got to keep to go. <laughs> Just one, huh? That's the only one yeah. you got. So now you got to, she's not that's a called. Jew, but she went out and took a, Jesus is our Sabbath. Yeah. I mean, well, people aren't getting that. You know what you we know? call it's that? Like, we call that easy legalism. Yes, that's right. Only one of them this time. Just one. <laughs> but uh, that's crazy to me. But I've, I've memorized this when I say it so much. They, being ignorant of God's righteousness, have not submitted themselves to the righteousness of God. Go about to establish their own righteousness. That's what they do. He just said it. This is every, he just nailed that. Every other faith other than free grace, the gospel of the grace of God, righteousness is in Christ's work alone. Not any of you, all of Jesus, none of you, you get out of there. Worthy is the lamb, not worthy is the lamb, and Renee. I mean, you can't, you can't do that. I mean, you totally corrupt his perfect work. It's, it's not a covenant God's going to accept. He's going to accept his son's blood on your behalf, and that's it. That's it. That's all that justifies. And, and these two verses nail it in the one after for Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believeth, period. You can't get none of the law. Well, you still got to live, bro. You got to. No, no, he's the end of the law for righteousness. You, you can't get clear. I, I don't know. I mean, the only way people can't see it is just they're just blinded. They're just blinded because these two verses just kill it. You know, I'm, I'm, I love this. Yeah, they have zeal, but not according to knowledge. Um, okay, uh, let's go back to the previous chapter for a second, the end of the, the last chapter. Uh, let me see. It said, uh, Paul ended up for saying, uh, but Israel, which followed after the law of righteousness, hath not attained to the law of righteousness, Wherefore, because they sought it not by faith, but as it were by the works of the law. So he's continuing making this very point here that Israel's mistake is that they were trying to attain it through uh, their own righteousness, through following the law rather than through faith. And, and, and now he's making the point beautifully here in chapter 10. And I'm going to read verse three and four in the Amplified. First, let me say, Brother Cripps, your point was absolutely 100% correct that all the religions of the world are based upon this, this error, uh, trying to establish your own righteousness. But I'll take it a step further. 
you ask a person that's not even religious, is not a member of any re organized religion, but they still think that somehow God's going to judge everybody someday. And if you're just a good enough person, that God's going to accept you. I'm pretty good. I haven't killed anybody. That's what they usually say. I don't really, I haven't killed anybody. And I'm not a murderer. You haven't? But you, but you would, if you ever got angry at someone, God says you're guilty of murder. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but that's what they say. You know what I'm I saying? Know. They'll say, you know, I, I'm a pretty good person. I yeah. try to be good. Oh, Renee, Renee, I'm not going to let you get away with that. That's the, you don't get away with that. <laughs> <laughs> Even if you have I actually thought. have killed someone, so that does not count with me. Oh, no. <laughs> she's, a, she's an actual literal murderer. <laughs> okay. Uh, okay. So the point I'm making is that even if someone is not a member of any religion, but just their own innate conscience and and, and um, uh, thoughts that, well, I think there probably is an afterlife and a heaven, and that we're going to go there if we're good people. Uh, that's the default for most people, if they unless they're an atheist and don't believe in anything. But so all the. I would say, Brother Cripps, the step further I'll take is that the default for the whole world as a whole is this merit system and personal merit. If I'm just good enough, if I'm having enough self-righteousness to present to God, he'll accept me. But uh, let's read this in the Amplified and see how it states it. For not knowing about God's righteousness, which is based on faith and seeking to establish their own righteousness based on works, they did not submit to God's righteousness, for Christ is the end of the law. It leads to him, and its purpose is fulfilled in him, for granting righteousness to everyone who believes in him as Savior. Believes in him as Savior. That's why when I showed you this shirt earlier, I said, okay, this is why Christianity is not a religion. It's not a system of working your way to heaven. It's a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. I forgot. I think I think I forgot to say that. What is Christianity then? It's a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. And the relationship is he is my savior, God. That's the relationship. My relationship, he's saving me. I'm not doing anything. I'm, uh, he's my he's my savior. I, I just, uh, I grabbed a hold of him and now he won't let go of me. It's like this picture of okay, uh, right here. Where is it? Uh, see this picture here? What will you do with Jesus? He wants to grab a hold of you and take you to heaven. Will you resist it or will you let him grab a hold of it? Because once he takes a hold of you, this is how I like to show it. Look, okay, this happened. Okay, you believed in Jesus. Now, Bible says he has you in the palm of his hand and no one can pluck you out. What happens? Yes. What happens? This is me. What happens if I start getting having a sinful life? You know, he won't let go of me. It doesn't matter. He's still got a hold of me. Yes. What, happens if, what happens if I have some doubts or fall into apostasy? You know, no, he won't let go of me. And what happens? What happens if I hate God? I don't even believe in God anymore because my family was all killed in a fire. And I don't even believe God, God could exist and allow that to happen. I don't want to have anything to do with that God. He will not let go of me. No one can pluck me out of his hand. So that's christ amen amen brother luke uh all right uh any more on verse three and four before we go on no sir but i love what you just said praise god that's that's exactly it right there he does not let go nothing will pluck amen. us out of his hand i just can't get over that it's yeah. it is uh his saving grace it's not based on what we do it's based on what he does it's not based on our, our side of the relationship, it's based on his side of the relationship. He fulfills all things. We fulfill nothing. It's all based on him, not on he us. He presents you spotless and blameless. He Amen. presents you. And by the way, they call Jesus a liar because they the Bible says that Jesus is the author and the finisher of our faith. Praise God. He will finish it. He began a good work and you will finish it until the day of Christ. He said that. That's my favorite verse. I have it on a rock. My mom Love made it for me. That, that verse right there. It's my absolute favorite. He will never leave you or forsake you. How 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 can they how can you be unborn once your spirit is reborn and alive in Christ? You you can't go back to being dead again. Can't go you back know? to zombie. 
Can't go back That's to right. zombie state, right? God does not abort his children. <laughs> no. <laughs> yeah. And I will say to, I noticed some people in the chat room had this concern uh, about their degree of faith. And I would say, Jesus says that even when we have no faith, our, our faith wanes or is lost, he remains faithful to us. He cannot deny himself. And the reason is, God cannot lie. God cannot break a promise. God said, if you put your faith in me, you're born again, and you're my child, and I, you're safe no matter what. I'll never let go of you. That's a, a, a statement by God. It has to be true, and it's a promise. He cannot break that promise. So he cannot deny himself. That means that he cannot break his promise to us. So even if you're fit, you're having issues with your faith, if you really understood and believed that um, you are saved because Jesus promised it to you, then you remain saved. If you if you ever had that kind of confidence in Jesus, and then later you lost confidence in Jesus, He still remains faithful to you. Okay, uh, let's go to the verse uh, now five. That is so powerful. I'm not trying to interrupt you, but that is just so powerful. I love Thank it. you. Verse 5, uh, 6, and 7, I'm going to read. For Moses describeth the righteousness which is of the law, that the man which doeth those things shall live by them. But the righteousness which is of faith speaketh on this wise. Say not in thine heart, who shall ascend into heaven? That is to bring Christ down from above, or who shall descend into the deep, that is, to bring up Christ again from the dead. I, I can't stop there. I've got to, it's not context, I'll go for one more, uh, two more. <laughs> but, but what saith it? The Lord, the word is nigh thee, even in thy mouth and in thy heart. That is the word of faith, which we preach that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth, the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Okay. Renee, I'll let you go first this time, Renee. So it's the, the problem, the responsibility is not always on brother Cripps. <laughs> yeah, uh, this is a tough one to break down and I'm not sure. Let me see. Um, you want me to read it in the Amplified, see if that helps us? Sure, go ahead. Okay, I'll read that uh, in the Amplified here. Maybe, it, maybe it'll help, I don't know. For Moses writes that the man who practices the righteousness, which is based on the law, which all its with all its intricate demands, shall live by it. Mm -hmm. But the righteousness based on faith, which produces a right relationship with him, says the following. Do not say in your heart, who will ascend into heaven? That is, uh, to bring Christ down. Or who will descend into the abyss? That is, to bring Christ up from the dead. As if we had to be saved by our own efforts, doing the impossible. But what does it say? The, the word is near you, in your mouth and in your heart. That is, the word, the message, that the basis of faith which we preach because if you acknowledge and confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, recognizing his power, authority, and majesty as God, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. It's by the, uh, the foolishness of preaching. It's by the foolishness of preaching. Salvation is close. It's by the words that we're giving you. It's by the truth we're telling you. Uh, so he's saying, if you want to be under the law, guess what? You got to keep every little thing in it and nobody's ever done it because it requires you to have it from beginning to end for your whole life. And so you can't be justified. So you're damned if you do and you're damned if you don't. Uh, the part where it says, who shall ascend into heaven to bring Christ down from over? Who shall descend into deep? He's saying it's that impossible for you to save yourself. It would be just as impossible to bring Christ down or to bring him, rise him from the dead again, you to do that, uh, uh, as for you to save yourself. But salvation is not difficult because it's of God. Uh, the word is close to you. It's even in your mouth. It's in your heart. The word of faith that we preach is the foolishness of preaching. That if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in that heart he raised from the dead, you will be saved. 
So now I worry because a lot of people think you actually have to speak it to say it. there's mute people. Come on. But it, you know what he's saying here. It's as simple as the confession of knowing the truth of who Christ is and what he's done. But to try to save yourself would be as hard as bringing Christ down from heaven or rising him from the dead, which is something that's impossible for us to do. But God did that. And salvation is of God. It, 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 to sum it up, Jesus said it great. With man, it's impossible. But with God, all things are possible. So I think that's what it's saying. Okay, thank you. Brother Cripps? Yes, thank you. So well, I posted the, the 8, 9, and 10 here for you in case you need to look at it. Thank you. Appreciate that. Um, so this is w one of the things that I've mentioned before that I love about Paul, and he keeps doubling down on the same point, and that's what he's doing here, in my opinion. He's, he's said all this about the law and about righteousness and, and the way that we uh, should attain it and the way that we don't attain it. We don't attain it by works, but we attain it uh, – by believing in him. And then so in these verses, he's, he's just saying it again, uh, talking about that uh, uh, those that follow the righteousness based on the law, that's not how you get it. You get it by uh, what Christ did by following the law of righteousness through Christ. That's how we get it. And then uh, all the do not say in your heart, I agree with what Renee said. That's the, uh, definitely um, saying that it's impossible for us to do it. And why would we be concerned about it? If we believe that Christ did it, then we're not trying to ascend up and we're not trying to go down and or anything like that because it's already been done. He's done all of it for us. All we have to do is uh, what what is said in verse 10. Um, oh, sorry, verse 9. Uh, if thou uh, shalt confess with thy mouth, Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart. Those are the two things. And then he doubles down again in verse 10. So if, if, we're, if you believe, believe in your heart and confess with your mouth. And then verse 10, for with the heart man believeth, that's what we're supposed to do. And that's what it's about. It's about us believing based on his finished work. We believe that it's done in him. It's not done by works. It's not done by our own righteousness. It is impossible for us to do it, but it's not impossible for God. And then with the mouth, confession is made unto salvation. Those those things are all that's necessary. It, it it's not the it's not the confession itself. It's what Christ did, though. That's the that's the point. Um, it's not uh, walking down an aisle. It's not. Yeah, you know, all the different ways that not looking up the pastor and agreeing with what he said. It's believing, 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 believing in your heart. That's that's what it takes. Uh, and uh, what a what a wonderful thing to believe that and accept that. And then we don't have to get tripped up by uh, trying to do the law and trying to follow the the way of man, which is uh, by works, not by faith. Okay, yeah, I think your thoughts on the earlier verses about the impossibility of, of um, you know, doing accomplishing it on your own or exactly right, and and then we get down to verses nine and ten, and these are uh, could could be considered problem verses in some ways, but um, I think a lot of people overthink things, and uh, we are so we dissect things too much, and uh, we, we dig a. a, a a hole for ourselves because of that instead of just accepting something that could be very simple. Um, first of all, uh, uh, I, I had open heart surgery and my heart was, my chest was opened up and my heart was taken out and, uh, and, and then uh, my heart didn't have any thoughts. My thoughts, hearts didn't have any opinions. My heart didn't have any emotions. My heart's an organ that just pumps blood. So where does this thing of uh, believing with thy own heart come? I mean, and uh, I'm, I'm reminded of um, the Ethiopian eunuch that listened to Philip uh, teach him about uh, Isaiah 53. And he's, he says he believes, uh, and now can I get baptized? And Philip says, if, thy, if you believe with your whole heart, you can and of course, what does it mean? Heart, you can't believe in your heart. It's, 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 a, it's, a, it's a figure of speech. 
We don't take that literally that we're believing in the heart itself. It just means something is heartfelt. You're sincere. Bill could have very well said to him, if, if you really believe, if you're, if you're telling me the truth, you're sincere about this, of course you can be water baptized. If you really believe, you're saved. Paul says, what must I do to be saved? Just believe in the Lord Jesus and thou shalt be saved. So uh, that's all that really means, believing in your, in your heart. Is that you, have, you have a sincere belief. And, and then the confession, if someone confesses with their mouth their, their faith, they're saved. But if someone believes uh, believes in the Lord Jesus Christ, they're saved, and that doesn't say anything about confessing with their mouth. Do those two statements nullify each other? No, because I could very well one person can believe and they don't make a, a, a public confession, and another person can believe and also make a confession with his mouth, and they're both saved. It doesn't mean that that the, the person, unless you make a confession with your mouth, you're not saved. But it is, it is a natural response to jump for joy and speak with your mouth. Thank you, Jesus, my, my Savior. I'm going to heaven. Thank you. Tell everybody, like, like the woman at the well had to go down and tell everybody about Jesus. You know. Okay. Any any more on that before we move on? Yeah, I I do want to address this, and this is what makes me crazy. People will take a verse like this and get so dogmatic about it with the confession thing that if you don't speak it out loud that you didn't get saved like they add that little work of and then you got other people saying well you can't believe that that confession is help i mean people are really getting like nitpicky over this kind of stuff so i'm so glad you said it yes of course when you believe on christ of course you confess he's he's lord I mean, it, it's not saying that you must speak it unto salvation. You know what I mean? It's so hard to to ex put it verbally, but I'm, I liked how you said it. But I just want to tell people it's not saying that when you believe on Christ, you better publicly confess him to people or you're not saved. Because I don't want people thinking that what they're doing is saving them. You know, you get what I'm saying? Absolutely. I don't like how you said it, but people, this is this is how man's mind is. We're so twisted. We will do anything to complicate the simplest thing. We do, don't we? Yes. Yeah. Well, you know, we often uh, uh, talk about uh, legalism regarding uh, uh, imposing laws on people. We know that's wrong. That's clearly spelled out. But we can also become legalistic about semantics and 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 this kind of a thing where we're uh, we're we're we're, um, we're taking every word and dissecting it too much and just of just accepting that hey yeah a person can be saved if they confess with their mouth because they believe now they want to confess with their mouth um okay let me go on uh that's uh 11. oh how much time do we have oh we're, we're almost out of time here uh yeah, we want to stop right at about uh, eleven o'clock your time. So let's let's make that the end of the verse. Uh, we finished at verse ten. Uh, all right, uh, let's take the a couple of minutes now before it gets too late for Renee and and Brother Cripps being on Eastern time uh, to kind of uh, let's sum up our our thoughts on the on the study. Uh, Brother Cripps, will you go first? Thank you, sir. Yes, absolutely. Um, I love this chapter in the beginning of uh, chapter 10. So we finished up uh, verse 9, which um, was very edifying to me. I, I, hadn't, I, uh, I hadn't really uh, taken a deep look at that. And, and what's been so helpful for me in being a part of these broadcasts is uh, to really, really look at the book of Romans, really, really, uh, you know, on, in the good way of dissecting it, meaning amplifying it and talking about it and uh, discussing uh, the, uh, what we each think has been extremely helpful. I've learned a lot and will we'll continue to learn as we as we go through these. Um, so we I feel like in uh, chapter nine, uh, Paul it has uh, taken a lot of effort to make it clear 
uh, about the, the difference between uh, in talking about uh, Israel and talking about the difference between works and the righteousness of Christ. Um, and he did an excellent job. It's clear to me. I uh, don't understand why so many people seem to struggle with this. Uh, and uh, for me, it, it makes complete and total sense. Now, I know I'm saying that from the aspect of someone that has already come to believe uh, in Christ's finished work. And it, it's easy to get distracted because of the preponderance of of uh, other religions and oh i was going to say that um the it's built in the very fabric of society the idea that if we just are are decent people that somehow we're going to we're going to be let in it's it's so ingrained in all things i mean just at least in america it is you know of, of being oh just be an upstanding citizen pay your taxes and and whatnot and yeah yeah don't murder don't rape don't do all that you, you'll be fine and um, you know, Renee was kind of talking about that when you ask people, uh, you know, pe people say, well, I'm not a murderer. Uh, yeah, well, um, if you've had murderous thoughts, have you ever thought to yourself, I want to kill her, oh, gosh, I want to kill that guy. Then Jesus is saying, if, if you uh, do those sorts of things in your heart, then you've, you've committed it. It's the same as committing it. So we've all done that. We're, we're all guilty and we need a savior, bottom line. And we can't get there, as Paul's saying, you can't get there through works. It, it can't be done. It was not accomplished by the sacrifices in the Old Testament. It did not handle the job. If it handled the job, there would be no reason for Christ to have been sent in the first place. He had to come as a perfect man and God and die in the flesh and be resurrected in order to accomplish the work that God needed because we are not capable of it. It's impossible with us. It's possible only through what Christ did. And Paul just does an excellent uh, job of this. And then in starting uh, verse 10, um, uh, he, he's, he's doing the same thing and talking about, um, there's a lot about the uh, how we come to uh, believe in righteousness again is based on Christ. Um, and I was just going to add that if, if you believe in your heart, then confession with your mouth or telling other people about it is just a natural progression of that. And some people are born and they can't speak. So um, then, then they're just out of luck if they don't confess what they're, what they're at, that say the words out loud, so to speak. No, absolutely not. The important part is, is the belief part. And then when we believe, we have a desire to tell other people. We're filled with that joy of what Christ has done. Uh, the jumping for joy part. And then we want to tell other people about it. it. It's not contingent on that alone. It's contingent on the belief. And uh, I, it's, it's just been a blessing. And I look forward to next week when we can continue to study the verses. Thanks, guys. Y'all got me fired up. I'm going to do an eternal security. Once saved, always saved video after this. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> All right. Okay. I'm so sick of it, man. I'm so sick of him saying, once saved, always saved is a doctrine of devils. Oh, my gosh. You can't. That's such blasphemy. Yeah. Man. Uh, did, did I, I didn't ask you. You didn't take to sum up your thoughts yet did you did i have brother cripps go first or you oh yeah uh, i i basically said uh um well i'm not i didn't do the whole summary but i just said i was glad we went over the calvinism but what i'm glad we're getting into now is how he's showing why israel doesn't get it uh because they're trying to earn it they're trying to earn their own righteousness and now he's uh, we're getting into the impossibility of earning righteousness uh so i i love this i love it one of my favorite sections of scripture. Okay. All right. Thank you. Um, okay. Uh, you know, all of the programs that I do, uh, uh, the Sunday program and the Wednesday program, normally we kind of fly by the seat of our pants. In fact, uh, all the questions that come in on Sunday, I've had Renee and, and Matthias both have asked me to not give them the questions in advance. They want to be extemporaneous. So we're not taking time to prepare our answers. Uh, uh, but this Romans chapter nine is the exception to our rule where I did take probably a month to prepare for it. 
because that is the level of importance that I have for Romans chapter 9, because I know the evil that has been done to Romans 9 uh, by Calvinists. So uh, perhaps you stumble upon this video sometime by itself, uh, or maybe you just stumbled upon this uh, tonight and you didn't see last week and the week before. I'm going to ask you to go back and watch the last, the three studies, so you get the full teaching on Romans chapter 9, so you do not fall prey to Calvinism, because Calvinism rests. The, the foundation of Calvinism is the false teaching about what Romans 9 is about, okay? Uh, okay, other than that, uh, um, it's always a, a, a joy to uh, be together with uh, you, Brother Cripps and Sister Renee and, and, uh, um, and everybody in the chat room. I, I saw Brother Hendricks had to intervene uh, with somebody in there and, and uh, get disciplined them. So you guys are doing a great job, Brother Hendricks and the, all the rest of you. Uh, thanks so, so much for your, your help uh, in the chat room. And um, okay, join us uh, every Wednesday and Sunday. And uh, don't forget to join uh, uh, True Story Live every Sunday night. And Renee, uh, go to her channel. If you're new new to this, uh, go to her channel. And especially if you're somebody who is unsure uh, about the necessity of good works, uh, or if you, you know that works are not required for salvation, but you have friends or family who think works are required, you need to go to Sister Renee's channel, and she'll she'll be a great great help to you. So, everybody, thank you for watching, and bless you all in the name of our great Savior God, Jesus.